Good morning. And welcome to the February the 19th, 2013, Prince George's County Board of Education's Fiscal Year 2014 Proposed Operating Budget Work Session. Before we begin, I would like to ask everyone to turn off any wireless communication devices as they interfere with the microphone and taping of the meeting. Ms. Jackson, please call the roll. Ms. Beck? Mr. Burroughs? Ms. Epps? Ms. Eubanks, Ms. Fellows, Ms. Higgins, Present. Ms. Waller, Present. Ms. Amid, Ms. Boston, Present. Ms. Jacobs, thank you. Uh, before I uh, continue, Ms. Jacobs is running a little late, so our chair will be joining us uh, shortly. Thank you. The Board of Education has convened this evening for the sole purpose of dis to discuss the fiscal year 2014 proposed operating budget. The Board of Education appreciates your participation in the FY 2014 budget process. Only with the public's involvement will we be able to craft a financial plan that best meets the needs of our many students and staff in Prince George's County Public Schools. The superintendent's proposal is designed to further the vision for Prince George's County Public Schools that all students will acquire the knowledge, skills, and behaviors to be college and career ready. Through the budget work sessions and public hearings, the Board of Education will fine tune the plan as appropriate and ensure it is focused on our key priorities, such as funding school needs, student needs, supporting employees, continued investment in innovative programs, continued fiscal stability. The purpose of budget work sessions is to ensure the budget process remains student-focused, equitable, transparent, and flexible. Tonight, our interim superintendent, Dr. Alvin Crawley, will provide a response to questions members of the board submit in regards to the fiscal year 2014 proposed operating budget. At this time, I will yield the floor to Dr. Crawley and the administration for a brief overview. Thank you, Vice Chair Boston. Um, before um, I begin the, the presentation on the budget, um, I would like to, on behalf of our Prince George's Public Schools community, um, express our heartfelt condolences to the families and friends of three of our students that have died within the past week. Um, please know that you are in our thoughts during this difficult time. So as we think about the fiscal year 2014 budget, I'd like to think of it as a journey in that as we go through the process, there's certainly lessons learned and also as we get um, additional information, uh, we make adjustments in the budget. And so tonight, um, some of the information that is presented to you um, is more so review information, and then there is other information that we'll classify as updates to the fiscal year 2014 um, budget for your consideration. So as Ms. Boston indicated our overarching vision is to make sure that all Prince George's County public school students have the academic pre preparation and experiences necessary to succeed in school and pursue their post-secondary choices. So as we look at the fiscal year 2014 budget, there are a couple of themes that I'd like to point out this evening. Um, first, our goal of continuing to support a rich and rigorous instructional program. And within this particular goal area, we've recommended some increases and expansions. And I've cited a couple here in the presentation, the expansion of middle college, where we're adding an additional 100 students, 
And so the budget will reflect the cost of tuition as well as transportation cost, continuing to support student-based budgeting to make sure that our principals are given the flexibility to provide good quality programming and the staffing that they need to support good instruction and good class size. Um, our secondary school reform initiatives will continue next year, as well as um, a focus on our alternative schools. At the last board meeting, I talked about some of the work that we've been doing to enhance the alternative school programming options for our students, um, such as implementing College Summit, as well as instructional technology, professional development of teachers, and other initiatives that will, again, strengthen our alternative um, school programs. Um, we've also introduced a competitive staffing compensation package as part of our efforts to recruit and retain highly effective teachers and other staff within our schools to continue to provide safe and secure learning environments for students and staff. Um, we had a board presentation um, and our security staff made several recommendations. Some of them are immediate actions that we will be taking as a school district. Others are more short-term recommendations and then some long-term recommendations. And we feel confident that some of those recommendations can be addressed um, through existing resources and then with some additional resources. Um, we know that we're going to get some funding support from um, the governor's office is a part of his initiative. However, to date, we still do not have a definitive amount, um, but we feel that this will contribute to the work that we're doing in implementing those long-term recommendations. Also, as a part of enhancing our supports and services within schools, uh, providing access to wireless technology so that all of our schools have wireless technology, and then finally, um, improving the reliability and efficiency of our student transportation. Uh, we've had some discussions about transportation in the context of the task force report, and we know that um, we've had to make some adjustments in our delivery of transportation, uh, primarily adding drivers and looking at our routing system, and we'll continue to look at them during the course of this year into next year to make sure that our system is reliable and more efficient in its operations. So tonight, we'll start by talking about revenue projections, some additional reprogramming on the superintendent's 2014 budget, which includes the governor's proposed budget. Um, tonight's focus will be on the departments of human resources, performance management, information technology, as well as administration and the Board of Education. In looking at our revenue projections, you'll see the progression from the 2013 Board of Education approved budget to the fiscal year 2014 superintendent's recommended budget. Here is a, a difference from the last presentation. Um, in the past, um, under the county contribution, there was about $7 million um, that we were losing. Um, based on discussions with our county colleagues, um, we think that there is going to be um, an increase in county revenue that will take us back to the 2000, 2013 allocation. Um, so the 626-8 number is now 633. So we look at county contribution, as I indicated, it will maintain the funding for 2013, so it's more so leveled funding. We'll continue to look at state aid from our foundation program, comp ed, transportation, and then board sources, where we see a reduction. In additional reprogram resources, just a reminder, um, looking at early lease purchase liquidation, these are things that we think we can do this year that will result in um, not having to spend fiscal year 14 funds, um, our school security initiative, the $1 million can be redirected to student-based budgeting. And then at the last meeting, I recommended that we reallocate the stipend um, allocation that's in the current budget book of $5 million to look at salary lane increases for $3 million, a $1 million for tuition reimbursement, and then $1 million for stipends. As we look at student-based budgeting, some comparisons here, you can see in fiscal year 2013, there was a, about $411.9 million as a base for student-based budgeting. We're recommending an increase 
to 417 million with a reserve fund that is pretty consistent with last year of close to eight million dollars. The difference between fiscal year 213 and 214, 420 million dollars in 13 and an estimated 424.9 million in 2014. Also included in the budget for next year are some allocations as we move the Robert Goddard French Immersion Program to Greenbelt Middle School. Um, there are nine FTE positions, five custodian, and four food service workers that would be added to the staff um, at Robert Goddard in addition to the faculty that is currently in place there. Some new information for you based on some discussions with the county and we are still working um, with our county colleagues to examine ways that we can partner with him um, in the Transforming Neighborhoods Initiative. And this is um, the county execs, well, one of his major initiatives, and we believe that there will be some funding of about $6.6 .6 million, and we'll work very closely to determine the specific initiatives um, around the TNI and schools. Um, but I wanted to just outline a couple of areas that we've had some discussion um, around um, 35 to 40 schools would be implemented, well, would be impacted by this implementation. Uh, we're looking at things like truancy and attendance patterns in schools, uh, provision of social services, um, after school programs, summer bridge, um, interventions. When we look at our academic data, we know that we are making progress, but we also continue to have some challenges as we look at reading and math. And so there would be some funds allocated for interventions. And then finally, we know that the centerpiece of our work in, in, in good school community relations is the work that we do around parent engagement. And so there are some recommendations um, for some funding to um, implement parent engagement initiatives. So tonight, we'll take a look at human resources. And there's been an increase. Um, primarily due to increase in advertising costs for recruitment, as well as some alignment work that we're doing within our human resources office. As we look to next year, we'll see a decrease in some of our grant funding, but we'll also meet um, an obligation through the state, and that's our teacher evaluation system, as well as our principal evaluation system. And so we've recommended some additional FTE positions to support um, the evaluation process, as well as to enhance our recruitment and retention efforts of staff. Under performance management, again, an increase to um, that budget, primarily due to projected grant funds that will be awarded from the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation, as well as some realignment in the performance office um, to strategic planning. Um, so this is more of a realignment of positions. In information technology, an increase due to the addition of 3.0 FTEs, some additional funding for software, and receipt of rates to the top grant funds to support data warehouse project and the implementation of Hyperon software. So the technology initiative is designed to meet our existing obligations as well as what we know we'll have to have in place next year to make sure that we have an efficient information system. In administration, board education office, a realignment in the general counsel's office. This is not a reduction in positions, but more of a realignment um, of a position to labor relations. And then finally, in the board of education office, some funding um, to our internal audit staff for professional development. Just to remind the board and our public of our timeline, um, our progression since January 29th in our budget work sessions. Um, we are here February 19th at a work session. We have a public hearing at 7 o'clock here in the Sasser Building. February 21st, there's a Board of Education meeting where there's the, um, hopefully, adoption of the requested budget. And then on March 1st, that budget will move forward to the county um, so that they can review our submissions. So that is a summary of where we are to date, and we would be happy to answer any questions. I will now begin the questions from my, from my colleagues. We will adhere to the five minutes, three minute rule.
Thank you very much. Um, my first question is, as I know that the county has um, spoken about the fact that they have over a hundred million dollar deficit. Is how does their deficit? It doesn't sound like their deficit is impacting um, their contributions for school system. Good evening. The um, uh, the county's always uh, got a number of uh, financial obligations that are trying to balance and trying to make adjustments. Uh, clearly, from the um, the conversations we've had with uh, county administration, uh, the executive is very supportive of education, and I think when it just comes to making priorities, um, education, K-12 education, is uh, at the top of his list. Okay, thank you. Um, the, it's going through the legislature now that um, Prince George's County might receive an additional $5 million for the net taxable in index. Index, right? Income. Net taxable income. Right. That we would get $5 million additional dollars uh, in terms of funding through the Thornton formula. Um, and I know that that will increase over the next uh, several years. Is our budget include that or do we have to wait until we see whether it passes the legislature? Our, our current budget, um, the proposed budget, does not include um, the, the $5 million. Um, we have already moved forward with the superintendent's proposed budget prior to the introduction of the bill. And so um, the current budget that you have before you does not reflect um, the increments that will be put in place as a result of the next net taxable income. If that passes the legislature, will that become available to us for the school year 2014? I believe so. I'm just... Uh, yeah. well, I believe it's right. scheduled to take So us. then we could come back and have a more full discussion about where we might want to make priorities. Absolutely. Um, good. That works for me. Um, this, uh, the stipend um, that we have allocated a million dollars for the stipend, what exactly um, are we putting aside money for? And does that include uh, the National Board Certified Teachers? Yes, the, um, uh, the, as you know, there are a number of different uh, areas that uh, reflect uh, compensation with stipends. Uh, the, um, uh, when it comes to compensation, that is all subject to negotiation. Uh, I think the plan would be that uh, uh, national board certified teachers, um, that there would be funding for that. But again, there's always the whole subject of negotiation. Okay. And then that also includes those um, lane changes that we, the, that's in the additional, that isn't under the stipend, that's an additional um, lane, salary lane adjustments. Right. That, also that again, would be part of our negotiations. negotiations. But the recommendation, um, originally there was the $5 million in a stipend line, and then we are recommending that three of the $5 million um, that we redirect it to salary lane changes, okay. given what we've heard from our collected bargaining partners. The, um, and maybe this is, uh, I'm not sure whether, um, Dr. Arbogast is not here, whether this will be an easy question or have to wait, but the student-based budgeting, um, I saw that there's an increase in student-based budgeting. Is that increasing the base? I believe last year the base was 3,077 comes to mind per student. Does the base per child get increased or is it um, different weights? I don't believe the base increase. We didn't increase the base, and that was in the presentation from last week. We would provided those additional funds, though, in the reserve to help assist in balancing um, once we know specific enrollment. Right now we have projected. So the student-based budgeting increase is really to allow for um, what the actuals are in terms of students in the classroom rather than the school getting additional funds initially. Is, am I correct in that? So they're going to get this week. What principals get this week is based on projections. They'll right. then turn around and get an additional set of numbers in April. It may change for some, increase. It may decrease for others. But that one will be close to um, what's 
accurate in what student, the number of students that are entering their building in the summer. Okay. So the, that additional funds will help to support that set number that will take place then. Okay. So it's, it's really not increasing their, um, their funding for um, the students. It, it, it's, it's to increase the funding to be able to keep the classroom sizes. Correct. Um, exactly. And those kind of things. Okay, Correct. thank you. I'll, I'll um, wait till my turn again. Thank you, Madam Chair. Ms. Higgins, I just wanted to mention, you know, you mentioned the class size, and that's one of the things that we are going to be looking at in this first round of SBB. It's something that we've heard a lot about in terms of feedback from our schools as well as our parents. So we will certainly look at that as a priority. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. Um, I want to be sure that I'm clear on slide nine, Transforming Neighborhoods Initiative. We're putting $6.6 .6 million in, oh, okay, explain that to me, please. And I would also like to have a list of schools. Can you just speak about that, about the Transforming Neighborhoods uh, Initiative? I do have uh, one of the areas um, in my school board district, and so I just, I want to hear a little bit more about it. How, how is that going to work? In terms of what we're putting in, um, just to, to keep in mind, when I presented the proposed budget, those funds were not there. They were not a part of the original superintendent's proposed budget. And then after some discussions with the, the county, um, those funds were reallocated back to the district, and we had some extensive discussion on use of those funds. And as a part of that conversation, talked about transforming neighborhood initiatives and how we could work together um, with the county. And, and as um, Mr. Sheeran said, certainly our county exec has made education a top priority. And to look at some of the challenges that we're seeing within some of our schools, within neighborhoods, and redirecting some additional resources and supports to those schools. So that as we think about um, provision of social services, are there opportunities to provide supports within schools? Um, as we think about after school programs, are there opportunities to merge some of the academic challenges that we're seeing with what happens after school as a part of um, improving outcomes for students, um, doing work with parents around parent engagement and parent education. So the whole idea is to look at transforming neighborhoods and, and that initiative, to look at our schools and the current resources and to bring those resources together from the county and the schools uh, to provide more supports to students and their families. And certainly I support that. So we're not taking uh, any monies from the schools in these areas, uh, monies that set aside for some of the programs that they currently have. This is, I just want to be clear that this is going to be additional funding that's going to go in to help these neighborhoods and these schools. Uh, these are funds that, again, have been reallocated from the county. But I, I would say that as part of looking at this work and looking at um, providing supports, there might be some redirection and sharing of resources, which I think is what we want to do. Um, as schools look at student-based budgeting and they look at specific initiatives that are taking place within their schools, are there opportunities to pool resources, whether they're staffing resources or other resources in terms of interventions, um, so that we are getting the most out of our, our funds, that we're being efficient, and that we're implementing more of a targeted approach versus a siloed approach in the implementation of services. Okay, and uh, I sent this out, um, and I'm not sure if we've gotten response on it yet. I, I believe it's about the nursing program down at uh, Crossland High School. Can you address that? I understand it seems that there's information that we are not going to have that program or some type of program at that school, and I wonder, you may have to get back to me about it, but I think that it's something that we need to follow up on. Uh, as I've stated before, I feel that we need to ensure that we have rigor and that we afford all students throughout the county opportunities to pursue uh, college and career readiness and assist. And so I don't know if it's the size of the program, 
uh, but just to know the status and what are we going to offer the students uh, down in South County uh, in regards to that program. I'll follow up. Okay, fine. Thank you. And I want to, uh, it's my, my time may be almost up, but insofar as the, um, the new VPA program at Northwestern um, uh, for the Visual Performing Arts Center at Northwestern, um, it, it's, we, we talk about that it's going to begin in 2014 with partial implementation and fully rolling out the academy in future physical years. What does that mean? So it will be for our in-boundary students for Northwestern High School. And when we mean phase in, we mean start with grade 9 and then roll up to grade 9, 10, then 9, 10, 11, then 9, 10, 11, 12. And so it's going to be music, dance, it's going to be everything. I mean, it won't be audition. It okay. will be only for in-boundary students who are interested in pursuing that creative performing arts component in that school. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Goes my little follow-up. When you mean in boundary, is there a cutoff? Like, uh, are there? Is it going to be situated like Suitland is right now? No. Right now, it's part of secondary school reform, so it's only offered to, for those students who attend Northwestern High School. For Suitland, totally different. We have an audition process and a waiting list for Suitland, and those students do not all necessarily live within the Suitland boundary. So Northwestern will not be on that same model? Not It'll at just this. Be for the to start the program, it will be for only in boundary. As we move forward, um, and then we look at providing equitable services for Suitland and Northwestern, then we can look at making it a specialty program in the future. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Ms. Epps. Thank you, Madam, Madam Vice Chair. Uh, good evening, everyone. Quick question about um, human capital and it, it, the HR process. <clears throat> to what extent are there, um, is there a strategy, and if you could describe the strategy to streamline the hiring process uh, with the system? Good evening. I'm Bob Gaskin, Director of Human uh, capital operations and yes we are looking at streamlining our processes for hiring and selection for the upcoming school year we're looking at utilizing um, technology and I see our acting chief here so if he wants to continue with it he can <laughs> no you can continue Bob that sounds good okay <laughs> all right no pressure no pressure. <laughs> the question is in regards to the upcoming year in reference to streamlining the process for selection and recruiting. Just kind of an overview of the strategy. Hi. How are you? I'm well, and yourself? I'm doing well, thanks. Um, so yes, we're, we're looking at a, so one, part of our overall process and strategy and human resources is to really pay attention to our, just our process for uh, recruitment for selection for hiring so that's part of our overall body of work in terms of next year um, one of the things that I'll submit to the to the board to make sure you get a copy of it is actually our strategic plan around human resources it's a white paper that we developed to specifically identify I know they're giggling I'm sorry <laughs> but it is a paper to kind of frame what what we are trying to do and I think it gives you a, a clearer lens into um, some of our approaches in terms of um, um, not only attracting but retaining talent in the district and so I'll make sure uh, I'm gonna be on record making sure that I give the board that <laughs> that uh, copy and um, so one of the other things and we've had some discussion um, and Mr. Gaskins talked about technology and that's maximizing our use of technology and, and being efficient around our recruitment and retention process and making sure that we have good tracking of applicants and that we're responsive in terms of timeliness of applicants um, whether moving forward or not getting a position and so we're looking at all of these different parts that go into the recruitment 
um, and hiring process and to make sure that we're as efficient as possible. And um, as uh, Mr. Anthony said, um, we will be providing some information to the board on some of the um, suggested changes in, in our human resources that we're going to make that we hope will result in more efficiency. Yeah, I, I'm, Ms. Golson gave me a little bit more clarity on the question. So um, one of the things that we're, we're trying to do also is we know that part of, I think part of the crux of that question is also our responsiveness to uh, potential candidates to the district and really having a transparent process so they understand, you know, expect a, a, a response in the next two weeks based on when this closes. So we're actually outlining a document that'll have all those steps and be attached to each posting. So we're working on that because we know that's a big part of it. Yeah, just as an FYI, I don't know if anybody's ordered from Domino's lately, but it's awesome <laughs> because they have a tracking system to when they, like, make the pie, put the pie in the oven, take the pie out, give, put it in the car, <laughs> and then the guy rings the doorbell. It's really cool. We, we might not get it to you in 30 minutes, but we'll get a better, we'll do a better job of getting it to you. So. Absolutely. <laughs> About 35 minutes. <laughs> Just a, um, a, another question in terms of I'm really sensitive to um, the proposals that we've received as, as a board with regard to what's coming down from Annapolis. And obviously um, many of these proposals have a fiscal impact on um, PGCPS's budget, uh, particularly in the form of on the expenditure side, unfortunately. So... I, you know, I know Mr. Lucci is fighting a good fight in Annapolis um, to preserve the integrity of our budget submission. However, the realities of the legislative process, you know, it could go either way. And so if we are hit with, um, you know, if, if one of the bills that have come before us that has these types of expenditures passes, um, is there a contingency plan for our budget? Um, you're absolutely right, and we continue to monitor these bills very closely, um, certainly from an implementation perspective and then from a fiscal perspective. And so um, as a part of our work, we've, we've been having discussions about possible impact of bills and certainly will bring to the board any suggested changes um, that would impact our budget as a result of any new bill, bills. Um, there is one in particular that, for example, we know will have some maintenance costs associated with it, and so it is something that we'll have to look at through our supporting services. Um, but yes, um, we, we are looking very closely at the bills and certainly um, for fiscal impact, and if there are any bills that we're concerned about in terms of our ability to, um, to fund, we'll certainly bring that back to the board and some recommendations for adjustment. Just as a quick follow-up, I'll just... Um put it out to the public that, you know, this is a wonderful opportunity for parent groups and um, uh, community groups and constituents who care about maintaining the integrity of a budget to contact your legislator or senator um, if that's going to, you know, to let them know how we feel about maintaining the integrity of the budget that's been put forth. So help us out. <laughs> um, you know, as we present the bills, get to know about the bills, and then take that opportunity to communicate with your legislator. Thank you. Ms. Beck. Um, the, the hefty set of responses, are they not available on board docs or uh, posted on the web page? They were just uploaded? Okay. Um, I'm, I'm just now seeing them, so, so whatever has jumped out at me, I will ask. But whatever I reread again tonight, I'll ask again. Um, but I think that um, they need to get posted on our website soon. Mm -hmm not just the board uh, website, but on the uh, budget website, because there's a lot of um, really important information in it. Not that anything else has been less than important, but um, the table showing the SBB allocations by school, when that says pending, what is pending? How long is pending? Uh, seven. So we're supposed to vote on Thursday. Um, 
Number nine. This is the allocation for last year um, aligned with the allocation for this year. So that uh, what I'm looking to see is a lot of the schools in District 9, I hate sounding parochial, but a lot of the schools in District 9 are not um, heavily burdened by the, the uh, ESOP population. That um, I know my district last year had 5% of the ESOP students that Ms. Waller's district had. And so when I go to my community to explain um, the bulk of funding that's going to ESAW, I use that example. We, we don't have the students who have those significant needs, but it's still difficult to explain to the community how we're not getting um, additional resources, not just for ESAW, but for um, the other bump ups. So, so your question is, when is that information going out to the schools? And I believe um, we did a timetable that it's scheduled to go out this week to schools, um, which is consistent with past practice. So we won't I, I have it before we vote, or? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, okay. Instructional directors received it today, so we're just checking to see if principals got it. Okay. Okay. Um, when you say tomorrow, does that mean it'll be posted online tomorrow or? Yes. Thank you. On question, on page 10, question 14, on the enrollment dot map for the, um, the Prince George's Community College program, could I see that broken out by middle school? The first year I had, I think it was two students in my district who qualified for the program. And I, we made such a huge effort to say that it was not um, a boundary program, that it was throughout the whole county. So I want to see that um, District 9 and District 8, the really South County districts, um, are getting in at the same type of percentage now that we're in the third year of it. We'll provide you with a breakout of the students that are currently enrolled there in terms of by district. By their, right. or by, by their by school, middle school. By sending school. Right. Um, page 10, question 16. Am I reading it right that we're $337,000 over the approved amount for the estimated at this point? So we've exceeded the approved by 337000 in additional catering costs. So the, the question, the actual question is describe the 337,000 in additional catering costs from FY 2013 approved to FY 2013 estimated. So the estimated would be more than the approved, so we're over. Do we need Is that right? The, 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 way that that, uh, the way that that column reads is the FY13 approved is what is in the current budget. Mm -hmm. The 13 estimate is where we anticipate um, spending will occur mm -hmm. by year end. Uh, the 14 proposed is what's built into the, into the plan. Okay, so in catering costs, we're $337,000 over our approved amount. This was a PGCEA question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that. question 16. Yeah, that's, I think it would have been helpful to have uh, PGCEA's table where they got all their, um, but it, it seems to, I don't know if Mr. Robinson saw that also, but um, it seems that we've gone over catering and that we're now budgeting in an additional 273,000 for FY14 proposed. And I see the rationale why we think we need more money for food, 
but um, I'm going to be quite honest. I'm looking for money for media services, and that's exactly the same amount of money that, that would help those librarians to go from $2 per student to go to $4 per student. They need that $273,000 not put into food, but put into um, Just note it, and we will certainly take a look at the allocation. Okay. Well, one, one just uh, slight amplification. Uh, uh, it appears that that is grant money related, and we'll confirm that. Okay. So that would be restricted funds. Well, okay, so even if it is grant money, spending it on food at that level, to me, seems a little, maybe it's not. We'll, we'll confirm that. Right. Um, that, would, that would help to explain the dollar amounts at that level. So if um, they are grant funds, then we could not redirect those funds for media relations. Right. We would have to look at operating funds to make some decisions. Right. Um, page third. Oh, I've already exceeded my time. I'll buzz back. We can do round two. So you want to hold to round two? I'm on round two. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. I have a couple of questions on um, on the the after school program and the truancy program. Can you give me some clarity on that? Uh, exactly how or what type of programs are you planning to implement around the after-school programs and the truancy ones? Number 16. So in terms of those recommendations, as I indicated, um, we've not defined those with the county yet. Um, we just had the meeting last week with them, and then we're scheduled to have some discussions with them about after-school programs. Um, but I can tell you that as we talked about after-school programs, we talked about ways in which we could um, infuse some of the academic work that students are doing during the course of the day and how that could support or strengthen what happens um, in terms of after school programming. So we will be coming back to the board with some recommendations after we have talked with our colleagues at the county. Um, there are also some existing TNI work groups that are looking at services and supports to the identified schools and then that information will also be shared with the board. Um, but in terms of after-school programming, we talked about making sure that we have viable after-school programs in the targeted schools, and then there is a mix of academics and enrichment as a part of those academic, as a part of those after-school programs. And the truancy? And the truancy would be on um, the more social services piece of that and, and looking at ways in which uh, we could engage students and parents in making sure that our students are attending school on a regular basis. So as we think about um, TNI and we think about it, some of our attendance challenges, um, the goal here would be to employ resources um, to look specifically at students who are having some attendance issues and working with parents and working with um, the community in terms of social services um, to get a sense of why students are coming to school late or why there is absenteeism and then addressing them with specific strategies that are that are family specific. Do you expect this to be like a partnership with the county on some of these, especially the truancy, the social services? I would see that there would be a partnership in all of those areas with the county. Okay, thank you. Uh, I guess we're in round two. Ms. Higgins. Thank you very much. Um, I'm also looking at the slide in regards to transforming neighborhoods, um, page nine, and want to ask about the interventions for third grade reading and fifth grade math. How are these interventions different or the same from students who are in other sections of the, um, our system? Um, I don't know if they would necessarily be different. Certainly, as we look at response to intervention, part of response to intervention is to implement specific strategies based on challenges that our students are having. So um, as we look at the schools that are part of TNI, we would look specifically within those schools at 
are recommended interventions and perhaps the strategy would be to increase the number of interventions that are available in schools and to help provide some funding support um, to those schools in addition to monitoring. Um, it also might result in additional staff support um, in the implementation of interventions. So I think that there are not going to be a lot of fundamental differences across the district, but there will certainly be some tailored approaches to the TNI schools based on some of the challenges that we're seeing in terms of academic performance of students. But if you were a poor reader or um, poor mathematician, in uh, another school, then it sounds like the transforming neighborhoods will get more resources to help those children than what might be available for children who are not in the transforming neighborhoods. Am I correct? Um, I think the idea of the TNI is to provide targeted support to certain communities and then schools within certain communities where we're seeing um, challenges that are impacting us as a system okay. and as a community. And I, I totally you know, support um, addressing need. I, I guess um, as we do that, I would also want us to look at a system to make sure we're not losing kids just because of their address. I think the other important piece to this is to sort of look within communities and look at decisions that parents are making about certain schools and making sure that as a part of TNI, we're providing those supports in those schools so that parents see viable options for their students within those schools and um, perhaps seeing less transfers outside okay. um, of, the, of their district. I understand. Okay. Um, and then I have another question in regards to um, the uh, organizational chart that's in the budget that has to do with um, moving uh, business partnerships, I think also parent engagement and constituent services under communications. Could you um, talk a little bit about what the rationale is for, for that? Currently within um, our school and community relations, um, it's housed in different places in terms of communication and how we work with our public. Um, and then within student services, we have our business partnerships. And then there's a position around parent engagement that is proposed. And then the third part of this is that we have constituent services, which is in the superintendent's office. Um, and the role of that particular department is to respond to our constituents in terms of any issues or concerns that they have either at the central office or school level. Under the proposed model, we would bring all of those units together. Um, I think the, the glue is good communications um, and making sure that in addition to doing the outreach um, around problem solving that we're utilizing our constituent services in other ways to do more engagement of our community. We've talked about community engagement and more partnerships and parent academies. And so the idea is that all of those would be housed in one place and that we would utilize the expertise of our communications department um, to facilitate all of the different parts coming together. Um, so there was a recommendation around moving constituent services, our business and volunteer partnerships into our communications department, mm -hmm. um, as well as the one position that was um, recommended under student services for parent engagement. So I think in terms of where it ultimately lands, certainly that's the um, purview of the board, but I would say to you that it's important that all of these parts come together in a coherent way if we're going to be more effective in our community engagement and partnering um, as a part of the work that we do. Okay, well I would just like to say I, my concern about having that in communications and that certainly um, um, I applaud the work that the communications department does but that's a whole nother venue and focus to then take the leadership role in regards to that and I would um, caution us all to not to move in that direction because um, the communication skills are different and also we have a new student services um, director to um, to help guide in that way and thirdly um, you know we're in an interim position and so to then make such a uh, important change I think uh, could be best at least waiting until um, we have some stability so thank you thank you madam chair Ms. Beck on 
page 13, question 23, workman's comp. Do we ever have uh, an audit of this specific on how we have gone up $11 million in two years on fewer cases? So in 2010, we spent, page 13, um, on 2010, the actual was 14.5 million, but the actual for 2012 is 25.8 million, and there were fewer number of cases. And you've itemized the rationale for that, but at, at some point, we can't just keep going up and up and up on workman's comp. Um, we, we need to be learning something so that um, we can wrestle our arms around this. Your, um, your uh, uh, assessment is, is right on target. Um, in the last few months, uh, we've been seeing this dramatic spike. Um, I've tasked um, the risk management uh, unit with finance to put together a reorganization because of the because of the losses, um, our sense is that we really have to start developing risk profiles and being much more proactive than just um, the, with the current model. Uh, and so, uh, because the because the magnitude of the losses, um, I'll be coming forward to the superintendent with a recommendation to add at least three FTEs to that unit, so we can be proactive and put together a whole series of strategies as well as working with um, um, uh, the third party administrator, Corvell, uh, to uh, change the model because the current model is, uh, is ineffective. Um, Ms. Beck, um, I also wanted to add, as we entered the, the budget process and we started to look at different areas, and this was one of them that stood out for us. And so I, I would say to you, um, Certainly part of the budget process is to get us to a point where the county approves our budget. But I think, you know, I keep talking about lessons learned and how do we move forward and learn from those lessons. And so um, one of the recommendations that will be coming forward as a part of um, the end of the budget process formally are a series of study recommendations and actions. And so one of the areas that we are going to um, identify for you is to look at this issue as a study issue with some ongoing work of staff and then some recommendations um, back to the board, just given what we're seeing in terms of the increases over the years. So should I wait? Or? Um, do, do we have this, or maybe this study group will be doing it, do we have workman's comp broken out by labor partner or? Um, That's something we can do. Okay, because I knew at one point, uh, um, and I brought this up a while back, the condition of our um, bus lots. And there were, um, a lot of accidents because the blacktop there is so bad and the facility that we have for our, um, our maintenance crews on the, for the buses are just in such bad shape. So in terms of does one um, union show up disproportionately high, maybe because of their working, maybe we are part of the problem um, in terms of why we have such enormous workman comp. Um, yeah, you're you're correct. We're looking at a, a lot of a lot of different pieces of that model. It's a current year issue, in addition to an FY14 issue. Uh, is in fact when the board um, um, gets the uh, financial review on the 21st, they'll, you'll see some resources dedicated to addressing some of the maintenance and and transportation issues, um, because it's it's a, it's a multi-point uh, right. process. I'll buzz back in. <laughs> uh, we're still on round two. We have two more. Ms. Epps. Thank you, Madam Vice Chair. I'll be brief. Um, with regard to the conversation about um, after school program initiatives and uh, summer bridge programs and things like that, um, 
help me understand how or if there's been any conversation with our um, teachers union about, you know, about that and how, you know, how that would work from the teacher's perspective. Well, again, um, this is relatively new information for us in terms of the, the resources. So our plan, um, I have a meeting with um, some of the county staff later this week and we'll talk next week and, and certainly we'll engage um, our collective bargaining units um, in any recommendations or ideas that are going to come forward. Um, certainly with this will come a level of funding support. So I would say to you if there are after school activities, we would look at what it takes to fund um, the initiative either from a purchasing resources point of view or um, a human resources and making sure that people are compensated for the work that they do. So again, certainly we'll be coming back to the board with some recommendations and working very closely with our um, collective bargaining units. Could we also look into um, some national initiatives around, you know, these types of community, um, what is it, like after, like after school, some bridge community-based programming around, um, you know, remediation and, and exposure to new, you know, to new fields and, and readiness and that kind of thing. It would seem that, you know, we can get some leverage out of being first in the nation and, I mean, you know, Maryland um, being first in the nation. So having expanding the discussion so that you engage, like maybe someone from MSDE to look at nationally at maybe some dollars that could come in that way or... Again, certainly we'll work with the county on this in terms of any national models and expertise. Um, just to remind the board that this is happening at different levels. Um, for example, we have uh, an executive steering committee on TNI, and on that committee we have representation from the executive cabinet here um, that's participating with the county staff. And then there is another committee. Um, we have a number of principals that are participating on the committee, particularly in the schools that will be impacted by TNI. Um, and as you said, there are some wonderful models out there for implementation of after school programs. We've learned a lot um, in terms of what works and what does not work. Um, wraparound services are, are, are big and so um, there are a lot of nice models. I know in Illinois they've done a lot of work in wraparound services and certainly we'll be looking at some of the national models that have worked um, in large school districts. Right, but I, I mean, and just so I'm clear, I'm not talking just no, about national models, I'm also talking about funding. <laughs> Absolutely. That's, you know, available for that type of model. Sure. Okay, thank you. Ms. Waller. Thank you. Um, insofar as the TNI is concerned, um, we're talking about the TNI, we have, there's a steering committee and my experience with TNI has been that uh, as a board member, I get things through the grapevine of what's going on in my area, how it affects my area. And sometimes I think it's things that are going on with the TNI initiative are things that the county should be doing anyway. Um, however, they are doing good things and they are coming to assist um, one school I know in particular, and they're reaching out to another one. There's a steering committee, and I asked about this before. Do we have board representat representation on the steering committee for TNI? Board representation? Yes. Do, um, or, I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Board of Education. I asked this question before. Are we represented on that steering committee? Um, yes, we had our um, first meeting last month, and we meet the first Wednesday who's, of every who's month. It's the board myself. Of education? Myself, um, Andy, Andy Zuckerman, Zuckerman, Helen Coley, Coley. Um, our new Andy, Chief of Andy Student Darryl Services, Daryl Williams. Who is there a Board of Education member that has been appointed to represent on the TNI Steering Committee? Let me phrase it that way. I, mean, you know, that's, we, we I know were, you, all are doing, you all are working with them, but I had asked this question before. Did we have someone from uh, a board member that's on that steering committee? Because we are not getting information about what TNI is doing. That's why we are having the discussion about the after school programs, um, you know, the truancy, because we need to know. Um, and we, I'm sure that we all would like to be a part of it. So I didn't know, I, you know, I read about it in the report that we received um, late fall, but I was not aware that we have representation from a board member. 
or the board chair? I think certainly that's a discussion for the board and in terms of working with the county board. And, um, we were asked for representation from the executive cabinet, and so we have four members from the executive cabinet participating, but certainly would be willing to express, um, if the board has that interest, um, some participation from the board. Um, I think the second part of this is um, I believe the executive committee has had one meeting to date um, of this new group. And certainly as we do this work, part of it is how we communicate to um, our board, to our community about what's happening in TNI. So I think communication is a big part of this that we need to pay good attention to so that it's very clear what's going on in those schools and how we can engage the community in, in furthering the work. And certainly we want to ensure that the community is engaged. And, and, and again, it's a way that we are messaging uh, the activities of TNI. Like I said, I think that uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great initiative, but the, you know, we're not quite sure of how it's affecting us. We're getting piecemeal and uh, information. And I'll have to come back for my next question. Um. Dr. Crawley and, and, and Ms. Golson, that request that the, we get a report on what's going on in those meetings. When you, when you attend those meetings, if you can bring back and let, update the board on what's going on, I think that would help us to um, know exactly um, what initiatives is being proposed. Thank you. I, I think we're now in round three. <laughs> Ms. Higgins. Okay, Ms. Beck. Page 14, question 25. Um, explain the $9 million that was anticipated for non-public placement that was never realized from the state. That, that $9 million is on the spending side. And so that's why it was not, in, it was not for that purpose when the budget was put together. Given, I, given, I given, the, vol, given the volume of our students, then okay. we wouldn't have allocated the money for a purpose that we wouldn't use. But we, we out, it said it was reduced by nine million dollars from from the current year correct okay so we're seeing a reduction in okay so we're seeing a reduction the in the number of students going to non-public but at the state level I believe they're factoring in the actual costs are increasing the students in non-public and that relates to the table that was in the back the table that's in the back set of these questions so there's a table that lists all the non-public placements and the number of students that are in those non-public placements. And we've seen that table before, and I think it'd be helpful to like align the table we got before with this table so we can actually see we're either bringing these children home or they're leaving our system for some other reason. Um, or we can mix show you the both. table, but my understanding is that we're, we're bringing them home. <laughs> okay, so that goes to page 17, question 29. I'm sure there's a 12 table. Yeah, there we, is. We, we'll, we'll generate a comparative table. Right. Um, question 29 on page 17. Our dedicated aides have doubled since 2009. Oh my. Page 1729, question 29. This was also a PGCEA issue. Um, but in 2009, we had 418 dedicated aides. In 2012 13, we have 898. So that's over double. Correct. Yes. Okay. And, and so now what? I mean, we can't continue to do this year after year after year. 
but um, if we're writing dedicated aids into IEPs, we, we do know that um, uh, the administration um, is, is working to comply to, the, uh, to an MOU, uh, which requires um, multiple years of uh, allocating FTEs, because for many, many years and in, um, in prior years, the, the, um, the activity was provided through using temporary Part staff, right. uh, which was deemed to be a, a violation of the collective bargaining agreement. So we went through an adjudication process whereby um, uh, the, the, outcome of that, the outcome of that negotiation was um, to comply with an MOU, which we've signed. And so we are now beginning to, uh, to address that. So we've addressed it in, uh, in this current budget, uh, and we still have multiple years to go. But how many of these 898 are um, in response to the part-time, the MOU? 150, right. And 14. So this will go up every year? Yeah, I would, I would think at least two more fiscal years, yes, ma'am. I'll come back. Am I still, or did the buzzer go off? So, Ms. So Ms. Beck, um, so that certainly there's the legal perspective in terms of meeting the MOU agreement um, as a part of the budget and a proposal. I think on the programmatic side, certainly one of the things that we want to look at is the use of um, dedicated aids and tying those to IEP requirements. Um, as we think about, for example, students returning from non-public facilities, those students are going to need a level of support mm -hmm. as a part of the transition. And I can just tell you from experience that that often results in additional classroom supports that are needed. Um, so that's one piece of it. I think the other is certainly one of our responsibilities is to foster independence for our students with disabilities and to start looking very closely at service delivery models and whether students need a dedicated aid or whether we can start to phase out the dedicated aid in terms of responsibilities. So I think um, certainly we want to make sure that we meet our legal obligation but at the same time on the programmatic piece to continue to look very closely at service delivery, independence, and how we're utilizing staff in buildings um, to be compliant with IEPs and to make sure that we're delivering good quality programming for students with disabilities. Ms. Walla. Thank you. On page 24 of the um, questions that were, was distributed this evening, uh, number 41, what uh, is included in the cost for the Office of Constituent Services on a monthly basis? For instance, I noted that in August it was $32,000, and then um, it went down, and then we are back up to 27000 in January of 2013. What types of costs? And I know we said this is, you know, under, you know, we're, Thing, the reorganization and everything, but what type of cost would that involve? I'm, I'm not 100% sure, ma'am, but I believe that that's the, uh, that's the budget of the department split over 12 months. It's what now? I, b I believe that's the cost of the department divided by 12 months. You that, then, that then is, a, is associated with the workload data on the adjacent columns. So, so one of the things we can get back to you on is provided to disaggregate the actual cost of running constituent services in terms of actual salaries of the people that are there and then any other um, costs that are associated. So the salaries of those persons would be set aside like this? Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. Of the people. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, we, I can confirm that that is the departmental budget divided by those months, and then those adjacent columns indicate the, um, the different types of the activities taking place, where they're either responding to a, a walk-in or, or a phone call or uh, doing some outreach activity or, or, or otherwise making contacts 
uh, to those individuals that are, that are communicating with the district. So the department's about $400,000 annually. I'll say thank you, and we'll talk about it later because in our, 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 we'll, I'll I'll say so, thank you right so, now. So, Ms. Waller, thank you, ma'am. Um, you look at the, the bottom line cost. Um, there are there's a director, and then I believe there are three staff atta attached to constituent services. So why so why don't we just call it salaries instead of cost? We could, we could. It, oh, okay. it's, it's, it's an addition to salaries, though. It's it's all aspects of the department. Yeah. I, I believe the last time I looked at it, the majority it was pretty much salary. I don't think salaries, there are any benefits, other um, other real costs associated. For example, professional development, materials, and um, their budget is primarily a salary-based budget. Okay. Thank you. So, Ms. Higgins. Yes, I have two, um, two questions. One is, is that whether you've been able yet to determine the costs of reinstating a um, counseling drop-in center where we had five in the past. Do you know the cost of that yet? How much? Each? Approximately 126000 each. Okay. All right. Great. There'll be a formal response uh, tomorrow. Okay. That would be along with Ms. Bex. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then I guess I just wanted to follow up on one of the comments that Ms. Epps made uh, regarding the um, one of the bills that the, um, are, have gone through the Prince George's County delegate, House delegation uh, regarding the turf bill. And if that bill passes, uh, it um, requires that artificial turf be put in four schools a year until 20 of the sc high schools are put in, and it allows using school construction costs to do so. Um, so my question would be, ha um, can we identify before the bill hearing to the full committee ways and means, and I think that's in a week or so, um, what constructions will not be able to be addressed? if uh, we, in fact, have to put in um, uh, turf for the four schools in 2014. I'll, I'll start and then certainly would defer to Ms. Golson and if she has any, or thereafter. any comments. Um, certainly um, one of the things that we're concerned about is um, how this impacts our priorities around capital improvement projects that we've identified. Through a, through a pretty exhaustive process. We had the consultants in and they gave us a report on the condition of our buildings and um, we went back and we looked at specific projects and in many cases reprioritized our projects based on needs um, and some of the recommendations. So um, what this bill will do is um, put us in a position where we will have to go back and look at projects and where those projects fall and the impact of those projects on this new requirement should it pass. And so we, we are concerned. Um, one of the things that we have stated publicly is that we have about $2.1 billion worth of capital improvement needs systemically that we need to look at and certainly this bill will complicate um, that in terms of funding. Um, we are getting some funding for the turf fields. However, that does not include maintenance, so that will be a budget impact for us. Um, uh, actually, no, it's the, the um, bill that passed the House delegation mm -hmm. allows using school construction, construction funds um, and also possibly program open space, which I believe requires a match. Right. So they are talking about our current school construction money. Sure. So and it's a shall. So I'll turn it to Ms. Golson, but certainly we, we are concerned about the impact of the bill. And our request for the state was for nine, over $90 million mm -hmm. for renovation for just the upcoming school year to be approved right. in May. So far we've only been approved for $20 million, which is less than one-fourth of what we've requested. So we find it hard to believe that they would agree to do $20 million for turf when we have not even come close to 50 percent, let alone 75 or 100 percent of what we've requested for our school buildings. So we're extremely concerned as well because we were hoping that they would fund for renovations to assist students inside the building instead of outside the building. Right. 
Well, that 20 million for 2014, I believe it's about a million dollars per field, and this would obligate four million of that 20 million. That is correct. Uh, for each year. So it might be helpful um, in going to Annapolis to know exactly what projects will not be served um, by that four million dollars, uh, if it, if in fact, so that the legislators understand the specific impact. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Epps. Um, back to the question about the IEPs. Am I correct in that um, Prince George's County um, houses or has the highest concentration of students with disabilities in the state? Is that true? We, we need to look at the proportion. Uh, keep in mind, we're one of the, the largest in the right. state, so proportionately, um, I believe we're somewhere between 11 and 12 percent of students with disabilities with IEPs. Okay. Um, I just kind of wanted to, I, I just offered that up as part of the justification for the increase in dedicated aids. So, I, you know, that just kind of popped into my head. Um, with regard to partnerships and, you know, um, community engagement, <clears throat> particularly around volunteerism. I got some feedback about the, um, I guess, the process of vetting potential volunteers. And I just wanted to understand the process a little bit better around fingerprinting and, again, looking for any opportunity to streamline, you know, that process or even aggregate costs so that I don't know, I guess, you know, I, I don't know. I'm just, you know, seeking to understand that process a little bit better. I'll, I'll talk a little bit about it. Um, I'm, I'm smiling because we had some real extensive discussion this year about establishing a consistent process across the district for volunteering and our business partnerships. And, um, and one of the actions that we took was to look at the MOU process and to develop a set of procedures around MOUs and how we engage um, people, whether they're individuals or particular groups in partnerships, to make sure that there's a level of accountability um, for all of our different partnerships and then that we have a consistent way of tracking our different partners. Um, so uh, we will certainly take a look at how that process is working. Um, our goal is not to um, create a process that's burdensome or um, will actually dissuade people from becoming partners with us, but at the same time we want to make sure that it's comprehensive and um, that we can account for all of our di different partnerships. So Cheryl Landis has been working very closely with our schools um, and centrally to make sure that we have a, a viable database in which to look at all of our partners and part of um, the partnership agreement is that they have to go through a background check and that has to be specific to us so that if anything changes, we get that information firsthand because a lot of times people will come to us and say, oh, I want to be a partner with you and I've already gone through a background check somewhere else and we tell them that we need it to be with us so that if anything happens, we get the information and we're aware and can take immediate actions. We also have two levels of fingerprinting, one for those who are just doing a chaperone for a field trip for one day versus those who are working with our students are going to be with them overnight or over a long period of time. I guess we're on round four. <laughs> Ms. Beck. Um, on the top of page 20, the ROTC program. Now, as I understood it, the service um, support for the, the program was being cut back by the government. Or, or we were contacted by the military and told that we have to cut back because we're not going to fund at the level we were funding. And so that's why and in particular, Frederick Douglass High School um, lost the Navy program. 
So, so in, in both cases where we made some recommendations around um, elimination of programming, um, a lot of that has been driven by consistent look at trends around enrollment. And so in both of those schools, we had low enrollment um, within um, the ROTC programs, in addition to some recommendations of cuts um, by the government. So in terms of the table that's on page 20 that shows High Point High School having two FTEs for $97,000, um, and then you have almost the same program at Surrattsville High School with the same two FTEs for 231000 That That seems like... It depends on the ranking of those staff members and the government pays for a certain portion of it and then we pay for another portion of it. So the ranking of the staff member, the two at High Point must be very low um, for $97,000 for two staff, that seems significantly low. And we'd have to go back and investigate, but I'm, I don't know specifically who those two people are, but typically it is based on their ranking. Um, so I'm asking for the level of military support by branch of service. I know that at the last time we talked about this, the Marines gave us the least amount of money. And that seemed to be why we only had the one Marine program, um, because we weren't really fully or even partially reimbursed for it. On question 37, page 21, the last line says the academy the, that's proposed for Northwestern High School will begin in FY14 with partial implementation. Are the figures above the full implementation figures or is, are the 17 classroom teachers the partial implementation? I believe that's full implementation of the program. So that's full implementation. So. Um, because the program will begin with partial implementation, then we're not going to need that level of money? I mean, it says partial implementation, so what is, what are the costs for the total of the partial implementation for 2014? Because the funding allocated is for the full implementation. And how does that compare to the Suitland um, level of funding and staffing? Okay. And we'll treat this as a follow-up and get a response back to you. Before we vote? Yes. I'll buzz in again. Um, question 38, page 22. What is the recommendation with regards to... Um, going from $2 per student to $4 per student on the media. The, my, my question was provide costs and a recommendation. So clearly I'm looking to support the, the staff, not the staff, the retired staff that was here and highlighted what $2 per student buys for media services. So if we go to $4 per student, What's your recommendation? Do you think it should be $6 per student or you're happy with $4? Double the mm -hmm. amount. So I think that that's a product, probably a, a good recommendation. We can move I'm sure on. Others I heard, disagree. You don't need to say anything <laughs> else. I heard what I wanted to hear. So. Right, it would be about 245 000. additional because it's based on population. And, and the the media specialists who were here were saying um, they were buying about 30 books per year with this money. All of the other um, dollar amounts on here all seem to be database or online fees. So this is for the purchase of either subscriptions or books. Okay. That's my understanding or replacement of books. Right. So we don't have to hear about Pluto so, being a planet. Um, and we've, we've heard that for a few years. So by now, I would hope that every book that says Pluto is a planet by now should be 
Go on. I, I would share that <laughs> position. Um, I did have page 24 on the athletic fees. It appears we've collected $241,000 in athletic fees. Now I looked, I mean, quickly at the table. My, my understanding was that the fee was $50 per sport. Per child for an entire season. So if I play per child for an entire season. Yeah, so if I play multiple sports, I only pay at one time. Okay, so on page one of the last um, attachment, the athletic fee collected attachment. Look at Central High School for football. They collected $20. Um, if you just look on the left hand side, it says Central High School, and then there's football, fall, the cash voucher number, and it says $20. I see $855 further up. And then I also see them 110 again, and then I see 20. So they collect over time. If a family cannot pay that 50 right then, they work out a payment plan. So that would explain why we have a $253 collection at Fairmont Heights. Correct. So it's not collected in the $50 clean incremental. We'd love to have it all at once, but we do realize that there are situations where a family can't give that 50 exactly right then. Okay. Um, and just looking at this table, it doesn't look very clear. It, it would look like you should be able to say Central High School football, all of football, um, with the total um, collected for football. Um, so if we've only collect $240,000 in athletic fees, is there a possibility that we could um, consider eliminating that? Especially in light of um, what we already have in athletic fees already that we know? We actually just had a discussion about this in the last week's cabinet meeting. So we are pursuing a few other options first before we make that proposal. Okay, so in the board budget vote on Thursday, we'll include the $50 fee? It, it yes, will, it will, because one of the things that we looked at, we looked at different expenditure lines, and so while there were pluses in certain areas, there were some minuses in other areas, and those funds would have to shift in order to cover those deficit areas. So um, it wasn't a strict correlation in terms of the line item amount and the actual amount in that account. There were also some deficits. So we needed to give the directors some flexibility to move those funds within line items. Okay. Um, I, I think that this report needs to be cleaned up. And, um, and actually, I'd also like to see the number there was a report that came out of athletics that showed by school the number of participants by sport. Um, and I know he has to break it out for the state by gender and race, I believe. Right. But um, it, it concerns me that, I mean, we heard $50 per student was going to be a significant hit for some kids who really benefit from athletics. And so if we are looking for a way to get out of this fee, that's, that's definitely my preference. Okay. Um, and especially using the funds that will most likely carry over um, from this year to next year. Um, it seems like you do have a little bit of room that this was not the windfall that, um, that I thought it would be. Um, okay, I, I'll just um, check online tomorrow, I guess, probably Thursday. Thank you. Thank you, colleagues, Dr. Crawl and your staff for answering the questions. It was kind of long, but we got through them. 
Our final Board of Education budget public hearing will be held today immediately following this meeting at 7 p.m. The Board is scheduled to adopt the FY 2014 operating budget on February 21, 2013 at the Board meeting that will convene at 7.05 p.m. From there, the approved budget will be submitted to the County Executive and County Council for review. Again, thank you for participating in our budget work session for the FY 2014 proposed operating budget. The February 19, 2013 FY 2014 proposed operating budget session is adjourned at 6, 638 p.m. That would be at 7 o'clock. Good evening and welcome to the February 19, 2013 Fiscal Year 2014 Proposed Operating Budget Public Hearing of the Prince George's County Board of Education. I would like to ask everyone to turn off any wireless communication devices as they interfere with the microphones and taping of the meeting. Thank you. Ms. Jackson, please call the roll. Ms. Beck? Mr. Burrows? Ms. Epps? Here. Ms. Eubanks, Ms. Fellows, Ms. Higgins, Present. Ms. Waller, Present, Ms. Ahmed, Ms. Boston, Present, Ms. Jacobs. Thank you. The Board of Education has convened this evening for the sole purpose of receiving public commentary on the fiscal year 2014 proposed operating budget. The Board of Education appreciates your participation in the FY 2014 budget process. Only with the public's involvement will we be able to craft a financial plan that best meets the needs of our many students and staff in Prince George's County Public Schools. The superintendent's proposal is designed to further the vision for Prince George's County Public Schools that all students will acquire the knowledge, skills, and behaviors to be college and career ready. Through the budget work sessions and public hearings, the Board of Education will fine tune the plan as appropriate and ensure it is focused on our key priorities, such as funding student needs, supporting employees, continued investment in innovative programs, continued fiscal stability. The purpose of budget work sessions is to ensure the budget process remains student focused, equitable, transparent, and flexible. More information is available on PGCPS website, www.pgcps.org. Colleagues, we will now hear from our registered speakers for public comment who will speak for three minutes in a public comment forum where the board will listen to your comments. Our first registered speaker for this evening is Michelle Forney. Please come forward. And before you speak, Ms. Forney, I just want to make sure that, uh, to let everyone know that our chair, Ms. Jacobs, is in the back, so please mark her as being present. Thank you. Okay. Good evening, Dr. Crawley, members of the school board and guests. Thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. My name is Michelle Forney, and I'm a graduate of a Prince George's County School, a graduate of Towson University with a master's degree in instructional technology school library media a media specialist at Highbridge and Seabrook Elementary Schools, and the past president of MASL, Maryland Association of School Librarians. I would like to share with you how ineffective it is to have 0.5 media specialists and a small amount to purchase library books. According to a recent school library study in Pennsylvania entitled Creating 21st Century Learners, 13.2% of students scored advanced in writing in schools with a full-time certified librarian while 5.2% did so in those without. 
The study also found that more students with full-time media specialists were more likely to score advanced and less likely to score below basic within the state on reading and writing tests. Additionally, more, student, more schools had students with higher scores if they spent at least $21 per student each year. School libraries are essential as we start the new Common Core Standards in Language Arts. While I do appreciate the addition of the $2.2 per student line item in the county school budget for library gut books for this past school year, more additional money is needed. At my one school with 325 students, I was only able to order 25 books for the state Maryland Black Eyed Susan program and four additional books. I wasn't even able to order any books for the new Common Core. Last year, 39 schools were able to pay half of the salary for their locked media specialist position and high school media specialists were full time. Unfortunately, other media specialists like myself are at two schools. My relationship with my students has changed since I am not with them every day. I feel like a substitute. Please consider finding a way to have media specialists full time at all Prince George's County schools and increase the amount per student for purchasing books. Thank you for your time. If you can give, uh, if you have your comments, mm -hmm. thank you. Next speaker will be Linda Bradley. Good evening. My name is Linda Bradley and I'm currently the full-time library media specialist at Cool Spring Elementary in Adelphi. Cool Spring is one of the schools that chose to spend some of their student-based budgeting on um, the extra half of my position. I'm also the president of EMA PGC, which is the local association for school librarians, and we promote advocacy and support for our positions across Prince George's County. Thank you for the addition to the budget for 2012 to 13 of a half-time locked position at each elementary and middle school and keeping the full-time high school positions. The $2 allowance per student as a line item for the purchase of library materials is also appreciated. More work needs to be done, however, to support school library media programs in Prince George's County. Since the average cost of one library book is $20 or more, and some of our collections have not been funded properly in many years, I hope you will consider adding more to this important line item. Smaller schools especially are at a disadvantage because they can only spend maybe $800 on new materials annually when many more than those 40 books that they could replace need to be replaced due to wear and tear and inaccurate, outdated information. Also, some of the older fiction that we have is of little interest and relevance to today's sophisticated and media savvy students. With the advent of Common Core and its emphasis on nonfiction and complex, authentic text, libraries need more resources to engage students and support the curriculum. Full-time media specialists in each school would also be better able to support new Common Core standards by teaching research skills and literacy in nonfiction and complex, rigorous text. If schools had full-time locked positions, they would not have to make the challenging decisions in personnel funding that often prove to be unsupportive or even detrimental to student learning. The Race to the Top grant is focused on school readiness for English language learners. School libraries enhance and continue this effort by assisting all students, including English language learners, to become college and career ready. This is also a common core emphasis. The possible sequester in the federal government may impact the funds available to the school system. Difficult decisions will have to be made at the county and state level. Please consider the positive impact increased funding to library media personnel and materials would have on student performance, especially in light of the emphases of Common Core and Race to the Top. Thank you for your time this evening and for your dedication to the difficult work of creating a budget. Thank you. Deborah Sale. Good evening. For the record, my name is Deborah Sell, and I have twin daughters that are now graduates of the PG County school system. My one daughter, thankful, thankfully for the school system, was funded at a non-public placement. She's now an honor student at AACC. So when you do provide what's needed for students, they can succeed. So now, instead of asking for money, 
we want to try to give something back to, to, to the school system. There's a program in, in the District of Columbia called Beans for Dreams, where teachers can submit grant requests. Um, a, a group of, of and, and individuals at our church has been studying this group, and we've been ment they've been mentoring us. We can't use their name because we signed an agreement, but we're trying to set, to set up a nonprofit for Prince George's County Schools called Dream It, Achieve It, where the individual teachers would be able to, to request grants. We plan, we've been working with the city of Bowie to get this off the ground um, and, and plan on using the same grant procedures that they use. Um, we invite Dr. Crowley and any, any of you to come and, and talk with us to establish need, really critical needs that you might have. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. David Kahn. Oh, okay. Good evening. <clears throat> First, I'd like to say that I checked board docs just before coming here for the uh, work session, and there were no questions and answers at the time that I could see, so I hope you've put them up by now. It might have made a difference in what I said tonight to you all if I had had a chance to uh, read over those answers, and uh, it's not very helpful to have a public hearing and not have the public have the benefit of the latest information. So I feel we're at a disadvantage. I don't know whether you'll be able to let us say something tomorrow. I know traditionally you don't at uh, uh, the session in which you approve the budget, but given these circumstances, maybe you'll open it up for us. Anyhow, on to what I wanted to say. Uh, two speakers ago mentioned the sequester. And we don't know whether it's going to happen or not, but it very likely will. Um, I hate the idea that they're going to send this budget back to us remarkably lower than what we sent in. It would have been helpful if we had had uh, maybe two budgets or at least some, some indication of what the impact would be and where you would cut, more, even more important. Otherwise, we go into all this hand-wringing, uh, as we always do, but it could be far worse this year than most. And the second budget cycle between uh, now and June is often far worse than the first when uh, competing for very scarce funds really comes out into the community and people start fighting each other for who's going to get cut the least. It would have been helpful and uh, might still be helpful by Thursday if you could give us some idea um, what the sequester might mean to us compared to this fully funded budget, if it is. Um, that's the, the main thing I wanted to say. Um, a couple of weeks ago I was here and mentioned the two reserve funds. The, uh, one of them for student-based budgeting, I was told after the meeting, was not really a reserve. It's intended to be spent in this year. Uh, it's just not allocated to schools yet. Well, that's fine. Uh, then it shouldn't be a reserve from a budgeting point of view. It's going to be spent for student-based budgeting, and it should, be, it should be shown as part of the expense for student-based budgeting because you intend to allocate it. The one, again, for um, the salary enhancements, I think, is a mistake. What you've done is set a, an amount of money that you're putting aside for raises, won't go any higher, won't go any less. You're throwing it in the middle of the floor and daring the unions to fight over it, and I don't think that's useful. If I'm wrong about that, I'd sure like to know. Uh, again, I think we need to change this cycle so that the um, uh, amount can be negotiated, then built into the budget, and then go into effect. Thank you very much. I would have said other things, but I didn't have the benefit of the information that Ms. Beck had. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have anybody else that signed up to speak? Did you know, Johnny? It's the gentleman behind you, uh, Mr. Coleman, has his hand up. My name is Peter Dawn. I am a resident of Bellsville. Uh, I'm also a president of the Bellsville PTA. 
I come here in front of you tonight just to thank you for the work you've done to Bell Street Academy. It's an old building. It needs a lot of maintenance over the years. Uh, but your staff, the maintenance staff, have put a lot of efforts and keeping up the buildings. I also want to bring up a few things that I think is important. I support education, and President Obama is one of his priority is support our education system. I ask you not to cut education budget. Um, also, I like the board to look at um, some of the performance measures that we should establish uh, within the Prince George's County uh, public school system. I don't know what exactly currently, um, what type of performance measure that we have in place, but that's something that uh, uh, to be competitive with our neighbor, neighboring schools. I think that's one of the system that we, we should think about it and implement it. Second thing is that um, I like uh, the board considers uh, increased teacher salaries. I don't have any special relationship with any teachers uh, in the counties, but they are all my heroes. They really do, they work really hard. Uh, I've been there, I see them do a lot of work and try the best for our children. Another thing is that um, I want to bring to the board about our local libraries as well. Uh, the county proposing to do some budget reduction for local libraries in terms of hours uh, and the service. And I think that uh, local library is one of the safest place that our kids can go before and after school and during the weekends. Uh, I find it a very peaceful place and a very uh, um, conductive place uh, to do homework and take the kids to, to introduce to our school system. Last but not least, I like um, um, the board to consider about uh, how to make our teachers more competitive, uh, especially for, for, for teachers that have been with our system more than five years. Um, I, I am an engineer. It takes five to ten years to, to turn out a good engineer, and I think that it takes maybe more than five to ten years to turn out a very productive teachers and consider those for our, uh, uh, in terms of salaries and benefits, just make it sure equal that people don't have a bad feeling about different people with different years in service. And I, I thank you. Uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak in front of you. This concludes the public commentary for this evening's budget public hearing. The Board of Education is scheduled to adopt this budget at the February 21, 2013 board meeting that will begin at 7.05 p.m. The recommended budget will then be forwarded to County Executive Mr. Rishan Baker, who would develop his proposed county budget and present it to the County Council in March 2013. The County Council must adopt the budget, which includes school system funding designed by category, and then it goes to the state legislator in April of 2013. The Board of Education will then reconcile with the county approved budget and it will be adopted at a regularly scheduled meeting in June of 2013. This now concludes the February 19, 2013 FY 2014 proposed operating budget public hearing. Thank you.